grateful I am to see all of the, your wonderful faces here this morning and uh, to be here with us on this um, extremely uh, important issue and during the CSW and violence against women that women all over the world suffer from. And this year at the CSW we've had the most people who signed up to attend 6,000, which in a conference that we do every year, this is just amazing number, because this subject affects all of us. I am particularly grateful and honored to have such wonderful uh, speakers today on our panel, and very, very honored, and I cannot tell you how much to have the presence of a most wonderful person that I respect and I admire and I may call a friend, Mrs. Banky Moon. Please, I would give you the floor to say a welcome and remark. Thank you. Thank you. Please, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Mrs. Sally Kedder, President of the U.S. Federation of Middle East Peace, distinguished panelists and guests. It, it is wonderful to be here with you today. This <coughs> has been a very exciting year for the Commission on the Status of Women. I have witnessed incredible commitment and energy from the participants. This year's theme of ending violence against women and girls is of the greatest importance. The female judges with us here today are both speaking out and taking action. They are engaged in critical legal details that are bringing about great progress to improve the rights of women globally. Through their focus and diligence, they are changing the way violence against women is understood in the courtroom and in public policy. These women are at the forefront of change and I applaud their efforts. I look forward to learning from the experience and wisdom they will share with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. I am, I cannot tell you again how grateful I am for, for your presence here with us. Um, I've known her, I've known you, of course, since you came, and uh, you've been a great support to all of the women issues. You are also our honorary president for the UN Women's Guild and the UNW, the Diplomat Wife, and, and I have never seen you not participate in any event um, that you are committed to and you have supported us for throughout the years and more and more. So again, I am very grateful for your presence here today. And thank you again. Please give her another. <laughs> now, um, you know, yesterday um, <coughs> some of you came and uh, participated in our event yesterday and um, as you know, it was about religion and the role of faith uh, for the elimination of violence against women. And we were packed, as we were also over, over packed for this particular event. And we had about 500 people who are SVP'd before we even put it on our website. So that I am eternally grateful for the good people who really follow our work and, and think we are doing and having a little bit in a difference around the world. So I, when I was putting this panel together, I thought, so we always talk and have talking about, you know, the laws, and we have CEDAW, we have 1325, and we have protocol here and there. And, uh, but yet this, this violence is even getting bigger and bigger. So what do we do? We really have to have solutions. And guess what? I belong to the international and national women judges. So I thought, why not utilize them? 
and it is thrilling to have you all here because you know as women what it means to be um, you know treated different or harassed or all of that and what is it what would it take for us to implement the laws that we have and it just so happened then of course we had the reinstatement by President Obama on the just few days ago so we are going to brief you a little bit about what that is by a wonderful person who is a professor at Harvard who teaches that particular subject. And I'm going to introduce her, uh, Miss Diane Rosenfeld. She is a lecturer at uh, Harvard University and Director of Gender Violence Against Women. Uh, she teaches courses uh, in law and social justice and theory sexual corrosion. The supervisors, no, she supervises, forgive me. I'm trying to skip it when I do that. I was just telling them it doesn't sound right. <laughs> so I have to take my time and say it even though it's a little longer. Okay, Rosenfeld received her LLM from Harvard Law School in 1996. Prior to teaching at Harvard, Ms. Rosenfeld served as a senior counsel to the Violence Against Women Office of the U.S. Department of Justice. She also served as an executive assistant attorney general in Illinois, where she provided legal policy advising on women's rights, environmental enforcement, and the ethics of governmental attorney. Please welcome with me Ms. Diane Rosenfeld. Thank you and good morning. I am beyond honored to be here on this panel and I think we should also acknowledge um, Salwar Kader's amazing work in this issue and working worldwide for peace for women, so thank you. <laughs> Not just peace for women, but peace for everyone. So in my short comments today, I will summarize everything that I know from now two decades of working on this issue. Women are stronger together than when we divide against each other. And in a patriarchal system in the United States or any other government around the world, women are set up to divide against each other for protection. And when we do that, we fail. So we have to, as women, understand our rights and our, the need and our ability and our power to stand up for ourselves and for our sisters and stand together no matter what and say no. That's really all I know. So now I'm just going to talk. Okay? Okay. People think that in the United States we have great rights, great women's rights, right? Around the world, developing countries, look to the United States. We do not. At the highest level of law, the United States Supreme Court, I contend that we have no rights to challenge male sexual violence. And the two most important Supreme Court cases both declared that. The first one was the U.S. versus Morrison case in 2000, where the late Chief Justice Rehnquist struck down the civil right to be free from gender-motivated violence that women's groups and with male colleagues had worked for years to pass as part of the Violence Against Women Act that was passed in 1994. This was Title III. It gave you a federal civil right to be free from gender-motivated violence. But the Supreme Court, in a 5-4 decision, said, oh, no, 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 that would just overturn the entire world. We can't give women that much power. Forget it. It would overrun our courts if women had rights to stand up against male sexual violence. And then in 2005, in the Castle Rock versus Gonzalez case, the Supreme Court said, that you have no right to enforcement of your order of protection. And Justice Scalia, writing for the majority, said that to claim that an order of protection, which some of my judicial colleagues will be talking about, is just a piece of paper if you have no right to enforcement, is hyperbolic. 
and Jessica Gonzalez, now Jessica Lenahan, had her three daughters kidnapped from her front lawn by her estranged husband. She had an order of protection in Colorado, which was a mandatory arrest state. There was a state law in Colorado that said police have to arrest and have to enforce an order of protection because police weren't doing it, so they had to have a special law. And the Supreme Court said they couldn't have known what they were talking about. Scalia said, usually I defer to states' rights, but the state couldn't have known, they couldn't have meant that it shall be enforced. So in this case, I can't defer to states' rights, so there went that. So you have no right to enforcement of your order of protection. This led me to a theory that I call patriarchal violence, which explains the prevalence and variation in male sexual coercion and violence around the world, which is, I contend, that in a patriarchy, men will exert as much male sexual coercion as is necessary to maintain the patriarchy. So even things that don't seem to make sense, like domestic violence homicide, like why would you kill your reproductive partner, or gang rape, because if you were motivated from an evolutionary biology standpoint from you know, getting issue into the next generation, gang rape would be confused paternity. I'm doing a lot of work in anthropology, which I'll get to in a minute, but really only one minute. <laughs> and, <laughs> and why do we see so much of that? And Morrison was actually a gang rape case, and Castle Rock was a domestic <coughs> violence homicide case. So I think that there's a symbolic power in patriarchal violence that keeps a patriarchy in place. And what do we do about this? We become like bonobos. So bonobos are a type of chimpanzee. And in the animal kingdom, I have learned from my colleague and co-author Richard Rangham, male chimpanzees batter their female reproductive partners. Gorillas commit infanticide, and they will abduct a, the, the mother and make her join his harem as the alpha male. And orangutans commit forced copulations which look like rape. Bonobos have eliminated male sexual coercion. How? Through female-female alliances. So that is what the structure of a bonobo society is completely different from a patriarchy. And it's not exactly a matriarchy, but it works like this. If a female bonobo was aggressed upon by a male, she would let out a special cry and the other females would descend from the trees and they would fend off the male, sometimes biting his ear and sending him into isolation. Then they reintroduce him to the troop. They have evolutionarily eliminated male sexual coercion. And they get along very well and they're peaceful and they're happy. And their female-female alliance dominates the structure and defines the structure of their society. And I think that we have to defend one another. My latest article is called, Who Are You Calling a Ho? Challenging the Porn Culture on Campuses. And some of the work on campus sexual assault that I've been doing, and, and then other work that I've been doing on domestic violence homicide, is actually reflected in the New Violence Against Women Act, which we should all be very appreciative to President Obama for his leadership and Vice President Biden for his leadership on making this happen. And I'm told I can't read this to you today, but, um, <laughs> but I have. And, um, and the last thing that I will say is there is so much that, that we can do to participate in society and know that we can change things. It is not inevitable. It happens because we impart our witnesses to it and we let it happen. And the last thing I want to say is you don't even have to like one another to know that you are stronger together. So. So don't say, she's a hoe, or she's skanky, or look how she's dressed. Just say, she's my sister, she has a right to dress however she wants, and not be raped or assaulted, and we have to hold these visions of peace in our heads, and we can achieve it. Thank you. I, I command you, on time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you know, just only recently, you know, in this country alone, when you would go and complain about spousal problem or sexual harassment, nobody listened to you. 
So this is all. We're moving. We're coming. We're coming ahead, and uh, we need a lot more. I would like now to please uh, introduce the second speaker to you. Um, Her Honor Kathy Hollenberg Surratt, a Circuit Court Judge of the Seventh Judicial Circuit of Maryland. Judge Surratt received the BS Phi Beta Kappa Summa Cum Laude from the University of Pittsburgh, a JD from the National Law Center, George Washington University, and an LLM in International Legal Studies from the American University Washington College of Law. Uh, she is a recipient of Maryland Women Bar Association's Pro Bono Award, Prince George County Bar Association Distinguished Service Award, Daily Record Leadership Law Award in 2012, Maryland's Top 100 Women Award, Sisters to Sisters Love Cares Award, and ACLU Advocate for Justice Award, PGC, and was Maryland Bono Resource Center <coughs> 15th Anniversary Honoree. Please welcome with me Honorable Kathy Surratt. Thank you. I too would like to say what an honor it is to be here, um, to thank Sawa, um, and to thank everybody here. It really is, is quite, quite wonderful. So Diane told you a lot about the problems and what's going on, and what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is the um, laws that do exist at this point um, in the United States for dealing with domestic violence, and a little bit about where it is that I think we need to go from here legally um, in terms of dealing with the issue of, of domestic violence. Initial, uh, just initially, what I'm not going to talk about is our criminal laws, so that um, on a criminal basis, if there is an assault or any type of criminal act um, against a perpetrator, <laughs> the normal criminal law will take its course. It'll go in due course, and so you can prosecute um, any criminal law now, and thankfully, uh, there's a much more um, of a tendency to to prosecute, indeed, when there is criminal action. But what I wanted to talk about is the civil statutory scheme that is in place um, in most states, though they differ a little from state to state, and they're based on state law as opposed to federal law. Um, the basic outline of most of the laws that provide protective orders or restraining orders um, are pretty similar throughout this country. The First and foremost, one can apply for a protective order or restraining order um, when they've been a victim of domestic violence pretty much 24-7. And so even in after hours, even when the courts are closed, um, one can go for an interim order to the commissioner in Maryland and to whoever the officer is in, in other states to get a, to apply for an immediate stay away order. But assuming one goes to court during opening when it's open, um, the first step of getting a protective order in most states in the United States um, is applying for and petitioning for it. You go in front of a judge that day. You're put under oath. And once you can prove that there's been abuse, um, you'll get immediate relief even before the abuser is served. So in Maryland, we have a form um, temporary order that is pretty similar um, to those across, across the country. The persons eligible for relief um, to apply for a protective order include a former spouse, a current spouse, a cohabitant, an individual related by blood, marriage, or adoption, um, a parent, a step-parent, a vulnerable child, a vulnerable adult. Um, and so that relationship would give one status and would give one eligibility to apply for a protective order. To get a temporary protective order in Maryland, um, what one needs to show is that there's reasonable grounds to believe that one of the following acts have occurred. Serious bodily harm, placing a person eligible for relief in fear of imminent serious bodily harm, and that can be a subjective belief. It does not have to be an objective belief. Um, an assault in any degree, 
rape or any sexual offense, false imprisonment, stalking, statutory abuse of a child, and that could be physical abuse, sexual abuse, mental abuse, or also of a vulnerable adult. In Maryland, if there are allegations of abuse of a child or a vulnerable adult, um, immediately the report will go to our Department of Social Services, who will do an immediate um, investigation and return a report to the judge before the actual trial of the issue of abuse comes before that judge. The relief that's available for temporary, um, for temporary orders include the following. One is that the respondent will not abuse, threaten to abuse or harass the victim. Um, secondly, that they should not contact the victim, and that's not only personally contacted, but by phone, um, by email, in any way contact the victim. That they shall stay away from all the places where the victim might be. So that would be their home, their school, their place of employment, the child care, the home of a relative. Any place where the victim might be, they're ordered to stay away from there. Um, they can be ordered to vacate the home, um, immediately to vacate the home, and as well, um, temporary custody of the child can be awarded to the victim. Those orders typically last a week. They're a seven-day order. What happens with those orders is that they are provided to law enforcement. Law enforcement will interview the victim. Um, they'll do a lethality assessment. And as well, what they'll do is get all the information as to where it is that they can find um, the perpetrator and have the perpetrator served so that everyone can be back within seven days. We now have a new service in Maryland that I believe is duplicated um, in, in other states where you can actually sign up to find out when it is the alleged perpetrator was served. And you can get a telephone call or you can find online. And the reason for that is that what most of the statistics show is that after somebody is served um, with a protective order, that's one of the most violent times and when the victim is the most in danger. So we want victims to know when it is that the perpetrator has been served. When the parties come to court, once they've been served, and they come to court on their hearing for a final protective order, um, much of the relief that can be gotten at that point is very similar. So all of the relief that one could get um, in a temporary protective order is also available in a final protective order. And the acts for which an order may be given are the same as the acts for which one can get a temporary protective order. However, in addition to the relief that could be awarded at a temporary protective order, there are more there is more relief available when you go in for your final protective order. Um, as I said, there's, you can get temporary custody in a temporary protective order. Um, the final protective order goes in a little bit more detail in terms of both custody and any possible visitation that's allowed. There is emergency family maintenance, which is an um, support money um, that may be awarded so that the so that the victim and the children can survive. There are, you may order various services for either the victim, the perpetrator, or the children. Um, as well, you can, there's a mandatory, as a result of VAWA, there's a mandatory, any weapons get removed from the perpetrator um, against whom there is a protective order. And so the, the, the breadth of the relief that's available in a final protective order is a bit wider. In Maryland, what happens is after one is set, granted a final protective order, um, both parties are sent to our domestic violence special, specialist who is a, um, a social worker to do two things. Um, one is that the social worker will hook the parties up with the ordered services. And secondly, they will monitor to make sure that the parties are attending the services that have been ordered. Among the services that are available are abuser intervention programs, anger management, parenting programs, supervised visitation centers, counseling and therapeutic services, and drug treatment. If one violates a protective order, and there's probable cause to believe that they violated a protective order, law enforcement is required to arrest the violator. As well, you can come in on civil contempt if, for example, one is not paying the support that you've been ordered to pay. 
um, in a protective order. In Maryland, they last for a year. Um, in certain circumstances, they can last for two years. And if the perpetrator is convicted in criminal court of one of the more serious offenses against the victim, um, the protective orders are permanent protective orders and will last w without end. The other um, provision that's provided by VAWA, and is true of all 50 states in the United States and the territories, is that every state is required to recognize and enforce the protective orders from other states. Um, and, and so those, if you have a protective order in New York and you come to Maryland, you just enroll the order in Maryland and it will be enforced. Another, another trend that's going on in Maryland and, and pretty much throughout, I think, the country and, and, and even internationally is the development of family justice centers at which services for victims of domestic violence are all housed under one roof so that you can get more coordinated um, services for those victims. So what kind of impact have we had? What has been the result? Um, one would think that we're pretty well covered by these laws. The truth of the matter is, in Prince George's County, which is the county that I reside, one small, well, it's not that small, it's about 900,000 people, but in one county in Maryland, in the course of a year, we have over 9,000 filings uh, for peace orders and protective orders. 9,000 in one year, with all of those laws in place. And so, part of the question is, is where do we go from here? What else do we need to do? And I was really glad to hear um, Diane's talk because um, I too was going to talk about Castle Rock. But I was going to tell you the next step of Castle Rock and what happened and what I think is one of the really <coughs> important moves that we need to do now as a society. Um, as Diane said, the Supreme Court decided that Ms. Lenahan and Ms. Gonzalez at the time um, did not have a constitutional right to have her protective order enforced that, the, that essentially that the police had no constitutional duty um, to enforce the protective order despite the fact that she had called several times for help and her three children um, were killed by the, um, by the father against whom the protective order was issued. When she lost at the Supreme Court, what she did is file at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and went to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And as a result, the Inter-American Com Commission on Human Rights found in its decision that the international consensus that a state's failure to act with due diligence to protect women from violence constitutes a form of discrimination and denies women their right to equality before the law. The commission found violations of several articles of the American Declaration of Rights and Duties, including the right to life, the right to non-discrimination and equal protection, special protection for children, and the right to judicial protection. This move from just our state statutes and even VAWA to the use of a human rights paradigm, I believe, is an extraordinarily important move on the part of the entire community and the entire world, really, looking at the issue of human rights. It's the hope that by using a lens of human rights, um, rather than just the statutes we have now, that we change how domestic violence is observed, so that judges and others don't see domestic violence solely as bad acts between people, or a bad act by a man against a woman, but rather a pattern of oppression um, and a pattern of oppression, and that domestic violence is indeed, so we have, despite all these laws, so much domestic violence, because domestic violence is a reflection of a culture of violence against women. Um, it, hopefully, by naming gender-based violence as a form of discrimination, we can challenge the cultural and governmental norms that support the continuation of violence and contribute to the change in culture that's absolutely necessary um, here in the United States and obviously um, throughout all of the world. So I think I did it.
thank you so much. And uh, it's a lot of knowledge, and we're grateful for all your experience and knowledge. Um, all right. Um, so I am, you know, we, she was talking about domestic violence, and throughout the world. Okay. You know, there, yesterday's event that we had, um, you know, a lot of countries go under the umbrella of religion. And we had an imam who was talking about that and the interpretation of um, their religious books and, and um, whatever they, you know, follow. It is so important because it is manipulated to to make, uh, you know, the women be abused because of their interpretation or misinterpretation. So I'm very grateful to what you guys are doing, and um, thank you. We'll have a discussion after, so please, if you have any questions, we'll be very brief so you can ask. Now, um, allow me to introduce another wonderful uh, a judge, Her Honor, Judge Doris. Uh, okay, again, I'm starting this <laughs> uh, Judge Doris Beshkrau, uh, she was elected to the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas in November 2003 and was assigned to the Domestic Relations Division of Family Court in November 2004, where she was, she is still is there, remained there. She is a member of the National Association of Women Judges and a member of the organization's domestic violence and women in prison committees. Prior to her legal career, uh, she worked as a computer programmer and had been a member of the Venetian Sisters of Charity until she took judicial office. She was active in the women's rights National Organization for Women. And uh, I would like now to present her to you. Thank Let's you. Give her a great welcome. Thank you. And I, too, am, am delighted and honored to be here in this very impressive gathering. Um, you may or may not know that once an individual becomes a judge, he or she is prohibited from doing lobbying, politicking, organizing and so on. And so where I came from about 30 years of activism in the women's movement and all of a sudden I have a muzzle and I cannot do those things that I used to do before. So then I, the focus becomes on education. And I'm going to focus first of all on the issue about uh, teen violence and then I want to talk briefly about some little history of the domestic violence laws in the U.S. and then just focus on generally on those countries that are now, or resources available to those countries who are now creating their own laws. Uh, as the domestic violence laws have continued in existence in the United States, more and more states, now there are some 20 states, that have specifically passed legislation concerning teen dating violence. Now, minors were always protected under the law because a minor can come into court with a guardian and get a protection order. Uh, and just like you can also get a protection order against a minor. So minors have always been included in protection orders. But what's important now is the emphasis on creating education, even in grade schools and junior high schools, on the issues of dating violence. And some states have set up even courts for dealing with within the schools their domestic violence because, and as someone who has been active in the women's movements for many, many years, every time I sit and do the domestic violence cases, I am so distressed that it just continues and continues on. And particularly with young children, uh, you know, females, all too often, it's a part of what they've known in their household. It's part of their culture. And when it happens to them, it doesn't register in their heads that this is wrong. So this is why education, I think, is very, very important. Now, and what is very significant about the federal laws and the most recent enactment of violence against women 
is the, the funds that are available for education and for advocacy groups. And the, the current law, and it was also Vice President Biden, who when he was a senator, was the one who mm -hmm. first sponsored and got the first National Violence Against Women Act passed in 1994. And so what's important is all the funds that are available for education and for advocacy programs. And the new law this year, one of the sticking points, two of the sticking points were the, uh, the assertive inclusion of same-sex partners. But that, in most states, the language is all gender neutral. And so most states are already enforcing same-sex protection orders. The other issue was in Indian, Native American Indian tribal courts, they did not used to have jurisdiction over an American. So if a Native uh, American woman had an American partner and was assaulted in, on the tribal land, they could not uh, prosecute against that. So that's been included in the current new statute. Now, interestingly enough, I'm from Pennsylvania, and I'm very proud to say that Pennsylvania was the first state back in 1976 to pass legislation for protection orders for battered women. That was back in 1976. The, a year later, a similar legislation was passed to protect Native American women on tribal lands. In 1978, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence was first formed, and the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights held a conference on battered women in Washington, D.C. In 1984, Congress passed the first legislation that authorized funding for battered women. And then, as we previously said, in 1994, that was the first Violence Against Women enactment. Now, the education component is very important. It is important with regard to law enforcement because everything happens at the local level. You can pass all the federal laws you want, but if the local police department have not been trained and educated and sensitive, then locally you have no hope or help. And so it's been very effective with educating police departments to become sensitive to incidents of domestic violence. Also education for courts. In fact, the uh, National Judicial College in Reno, um, Nevada, has a specific course on domestic violence so that new judges can go to and judges who have been on the bench. So the education of, of law enforcement as well as the courts have been a very important component, uh, all of which have benefited from all the funds that have been available nationally. And even, for example, in Philadelphia, we do have uh, volunteers from the advocacy groups that come into the courtroom and they help counsel um, women. They sometimes get agreements, and they also work with the individuals uh, who are the defendants. I, and in some of your, one of the pass outs is a, a few pages of the Pennsylvania statute, that's the current statute. I also included in that copies of the temporary order, and again, um, as Judge Charette said, they are, they are very similar in all the states. They may differ somewhat. And I also included a copy of the petition, the information that's asked for. And um, it's particularly with regard to immigrants or anybody who is here, say, without a, a green card, for qualification for the laws, there are no criteria other than you are a victim, and it happened in that jurisdiction. So individuals who do not have a green card or do not have any other legal status qualify, and that's not, that's not a, a requirement. And also what's important is that, for example, there are no filing fees required. You just walk in, and in most jurisdictions, there's 24-hour service. Uh, in a place like Philadelphia, where we have communities of various nationalities, Interpreter services are available, and one of our uh, judges who's done a lot of work um, on domestic violence, Judge Ida Chen, has perhaps 10 or 15 orders in different languages that are available uh, because it's important. And, and I see, whenever I sit in court, uh, representatives from almost any and every ethnic population 
coming into the city, uh, coming into the courts for protection. And if the one county in Maryland had uh, some 9,000, in Philadelphia in 2012, there were about 12,000 petitions filed. Now, but what is most distressing, and again, it's the education component, 58% of those were not prosecuted. 58% of the petitions filed, the women didn't come back. Well, I, sh I shouldn't say necessarily women, because uh, remember, you can have men, men uh, as well, and you also have family members. It's very distressing, for example, when you have a parent filing a petition for protection order against a child. Uh, and family members. And of course, sometimes it's abused. You can have family members where a parent dies without a will and they want to get the property and they file a petition for protection order to try to get their brother or sister evicted from the house. So of course there is abuse, but the expansion of availability is almost universal. Uh, and also, again, the education component. Of the 20 homicides in Philadelphia that were domestic relations um, sourced or identified, only one of those complainants had a protection order. So again, the education component is really, really very important. And for those of you in the United States, I liken it to <coughs> Mothers Against Drunken <coughs> Driving, who years ago, you know, started this long, long, long campaign when 20, 30 years ago to talk about something like a designated driver. Oh, whoever heard of that? How stupid can you be? And now, among young people, when they go out for a night, they have a designated driver. So I am convinced that with a much more focus on education, <coughs> we can address the things that are needed. And now, just briefly, uh, as I uh, stated, it takes a long period of time. So those nations who are getting new to the issue, you have to expect that it's going to take a long period of time. Advocacy groups are very, very, very important because it's the advocacy groups that identify a legislator who will co sponsor the legislation. And then the advocacy groups do the lobbying to try to get support for the legislation. And for example, the, um, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Domestic Violence Against Women, CETA, you may or may not know the United States is only one of uh, six countries in the entire world that hasn't passed it, and that's because some of the conservatives are the opinion that they do not want to subject the United States to uh, foreign laws. We would become subject to them. But notwithstanding that, however, uh, there are many, uh, um, uh, many participants whose treatment of women, however, is uh, atrocious is, you know, too light a word to, to speak about that. So. CEDA uh, does, would provide some uh, substance background because it requires equal treatment and the elimination of discrimination against <coughs> women. And certainly you cannot have equal rights as a woman if you don't have freedom from violence, which keeps you suppressed. Uh, and I also want to point out one of my other uh, publication, excuse me, um, flyers. There's a, a group called the Advocates for Human Rights. It's this one page. And on the back, it identifies the agency and the contact information. And they are from Minneapolis, Minnesota. This agency uh, work and purpose is to serve as resources for whether it's states or other countries who are doing their own legislation. And I was informed yesterday in conversation with them that, for example, all of the 28 nations that formerly comprised the um, Soviet Union now all have their own forms of some type of domestic violence laws. So this is a very important resource for those of you who are looking for guidance. And again, thank you so very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, please give a big hand to Mrs. Moon. She's okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
know, um, she's just an amazing person, and she has a full schedule, and yeah, she did come and uh, to be with us. Um, I want to just make a comment on uh, Mothers Against Drunk and Driving. You know, it is the stiffest, stiffest law that I am aware of in the 50 states, and everybody follow it. And the mother who started it is Lebanese, like me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it takes it takes a lot of um, effort and and stubbornness to really make a difference. I, I have a letter which I received from the uh, congresswoman, and she insisted for me to read it today also for, um, but I couldn't do it before. Um, and I'm sure you all know her, Carolyn Maloney. She is very active in, in you know, seeing all of you, you know her, but. Um, so, so she wrote the Campus Sexual Assault Elimination Act that's part of the Violence Against Women Act that can, is really going to decrease rape on college campuses. It's a very important piece of legislation, so we thank her for that. Yeah. I uh, was with her every year for the past 10 years. I had then invited by Congress and Senate to my husband and myself and our kids to be at the prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C. with the sitting president. This, of course, the past five years has been uh, President Obama, and before, of course, it was Bush. And she was there, and we were together in the same um, function. And um, so she sent this letter because they're all voting today and tomorrow, uh, I'm sure you know that, uh, to all the friends of the U.S. Federation for Middle East Peace. I am delighted to send my warmest wishes to the U.S. Federation and to the attendees of the 57th Commission on the Status of Women. Each year, member of the states and the United Nations convene to discuss policies to combat violence against women and girls around the world and assess progress made toward achieving the goal of gender equality. The USFMEP is a nonprofit organization that <coughs> promotes international peace through seminars, outreach programs that increase awareness of Middle Eastern history, religion, and culture throughout the United States and Europe. Through meaningful community outreach, uh, seeks to inspire stability and empowering of women and girls to increase their involvement in the political process are central to the USFMEP mission. These priorities are demonstrated in the two events hosted by USFMEP during this year commission, the influence of faith and this particular one with the judges. This import, important presentation will bring to light the various challenges of eliminating gender-based violence and discrimination. <clears throat> I commend USFMEP President and Founder Salwa Sally Cater for her many years of leadership promoting religious tolerance and female empowerment around the world. Again, the USFMP has done extraordinary work to enhance the self-reliance and security of Middle Eastern women around the world. The organization truly recognizes that gender equality is essential to the peace process. I send my best wishes to all participants on the Commission of Women and for this productive session and to all the U.S. Federation for Middle East Peace Friends. Thank you, and I thank you all. Thank you so, so she wasn't able to come. Three of them, three women, are congresswomen. Uh, I would like now to introduce another uh, fantastic judge who is um, it's Judge Her Honor. Her Honor Elizabeth A. Lamb, United States Immigration Judge, BA, College of Mount St. Vincent, New York, Law Degree, St. John University, New York, appointed to Immigration Court September 1995. 
Her previous work experience was NYC Department of Consumers Affairs, Legislative Assistant Honorable Hugh L. Carey, Legislative Assistant to Speechwriter NYS, Department of Criminal Justice Services, Litigation Unit, St. Regis Paper Company, Senior EEO Council, Catholic Charities, Archdiocese of New York, Immigration Council, Private Practice, Immigration, I, Immigration. So I would like you to all welcome with me her honor, Judge Lamb. Thank you very much. You can see from my background, I wasn't going to all girls schools, to all boys schools, and then to all boys clubs, and here I am. Today I have gray hair, but I made it. Huh? So, uh, violence is a provocative word when it's used on its own, but when you use it in conjunction, in conjunction with the words women and girls, it gives rise to the additional motions of anger, fear, and frustration, and if it doesn't, I submit that it should. So we sit here today in one of the most modern cities of the world in this very comfortable room, and in doing so, we still must acknowledge the global ramifications of the violence that exists today, not only in foreign countries, which are the stories that I hear, but in the United States itself. And that's been uh, told to us today by my colleagues and by Professor Rosenfeld. So I owe a great debt to Sawa Kader and to my colleagues from whom I have learned uh, some very interesting uh, things about the law today. And I'm grateful to be given the chance to, as a, a great writer once said, speak out loud, you know, and they say you should come here and live out loud. And as my colleague Dara says, when you sit on the bench, you're limited to how loud you can be. So hitting here, sitting here on non-U.S. soil, uh, I must say that uh, I, I'm a little louder than perhaps I would normally be. Uh, but I must tell you that my views are those of my own and not the uh, Department of Justice, which is the uh, uh, agency under which my court exists. And if that sounds like I was told to sell it, you're absolutely right. That's what I said. And so I'm happy to do that. My work involves people who come to the United States and they're called immigrants or aliens. An immigrant is a person who comes here and either does or does not want to stay in the United States. It's actually a legal concept uh, that we use quite freely and we don't always get the correct definition. But the immigrant does not have the constitutional rights afforded to citizens of the United States, but they do have rights and there are avenues where an immigrant can end up with a green card, which is the popular term for permanent residence. And as many of you probably know, it hasn't been green in many years. I think it's pink or beige right now, but nonetheless, it's permanent residence status. And there are avenues where people can obtain United States citizenship, obviously. So when people get to me, and specifically when the women get to me, it's often after they have been already through the courts in the United States. Now, the women who come to me, I admire because they have been battered, perhaps not in the uh, Webster definition sense of violence, because I believe violence against women can also uh, include mental violence. Now, women come to me, and I see when they sit in the courtroom, the fear on their face. Now, it happens with men as well. But with women, they look at, I am sitting there in a black robe, another authority figure. They are sometimes afraid to tell me what has happened. And when women are in my courtroom, they arrive there sometimes on a circuitous route, which I don't have the time to tell you. But let us just say that they come here because they're seeking political asylum. So that means they have to show they were persecuted in their country on account of one of five enumerated grounds. And those grounds are race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. So when they end up in front of me, they stand up, they swear, they tell the truth, that we have an interpreter there for them, they sit down, and then the questioning begins, both by their lawyer and then cross-examination by a lawyer for the United States government. This is a fearful and perhaps somewhat intimidating situation. They've left their country sometimes by means of bribery, because that's how you get out of where you are. They have entered the United States sometimes with someone else's passport. That's a lie. Uh, they have fled here, 
and sometimes uh, they are uh, very reluctant to tell me what happened to them. Sometimes because they're ashamed of what happened to them. There are men in the room, perhaps the interpreter is a man, uh, perhaps the, the other um, uh, attorney is a man. Sometimes they ask for a woman a judge or a woman lawyer, but not usually. Uh, there are so many. We have thousands of people in the New York court on our calendar. So they arrive and the questioning begins. Now it might sound easy or I believe it's too simplistic to say if you testify that I was a member of a, a political party and because of that I was beaten and imprisoned and so I fled. But the questioning will be, what is the name of the party? What year did the party form? What was your role? Were you just a member of the party? Or were you, how in your country would they find you if you went back? Is it not possible for you to live in a different part of your country? Why must you come here? Now women sometimes hesitate, and I see like deer in headlights, and part of the instructions on judging credibility is to look at the specificity and the detail with which an individual testifies. And sometimes you look at their demeanor. Demeanor is a very, something I do not rely on because some people show emotion, some people show no emotion. The Department of Justice does give us education, and my colleague was mentioning that, which is so important because the fact that someone bursts into tears does not necessarily mean they're not weaving a story. The fact that they showed no emotion at all also could mean this it was so horrific to them they really just can barely tell you what's happening. Last week I had a situation, we don't discuss ongoing cases, but at any rate, uh, <laughs> this woman was testifying about things that happened to her and she couldn't quite remember, was it April, was it March, uh, in the year of uh, 23, 2003. She came here in the 90s. So the uh, Assistant Chief Counsel for the government says, how is it that you cannot remember things that happened to you in 2003 and you're giving me exact times, <coughs> dates of something that happened to you in 1997? What happened to her in 1997 was a forced abortion in her country. And the woman looked up and she looked and she said, because that was my child. And in that moment, I believed her. So you can't always go on demeanor because it's a very godlike, and none of us are God, to assess credibility. Because my job is to say, is this person telling the truth? How do I know if this person is telling the truth? One thing, you have to use some objective criteria. When the person starts talking to you on direct examination, do they tell the same story on cross-examination? You look at their written application for asylum. Is the testimony the same? Did 10 policemen come and get them in the middle of the night, or did two people come to their house in the morning? This goes back and forth. It's very important to have well-trained lawyers. There are so many cases before the immigration court. We are out now to the year 2016. So lawyers get these cases. Perhaps they don't have the time to do the work they do. The Department of Justice is having a major outreach to law firms in our area and other areas. We have a, a judge, uh, Noel Brennan, who is spearheading a pro bono initiative in our court, reaching out to the private bar, to people who uh, make millions of dollars in tax law, corporate law. We're saying, come in and we'll train you. We have uh, seminars, there's one at the end of the month where we, we put on mock trials. So you can see, if I were to go into tax court, I'd be like, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, so when they come into immigration court, they have to be trained. And so the uh, New York bar has been very good to us. We're not a, a friendly place to come. You come in, there's a metal detector, you have to take your belt off. We don't have a cloakroom for your coats. Not so friendly, you know, but uh, they have been very good in reaching out and helping us with these cases. But again, when women come in, they are reluctant to talk about some of their abuse. Now, as far as abuse goes, we have the Violence Against Women Act. That is different from a case of domestic violence. The Violence Against Women's Act covers spouses in the immigration portion of it who were married to a permanent resident or a citizen of the United States. If they suffer abuse, they file a petition. We do not see many of those cases in the actual courtroom because they are handled with petitions. However, my colleagues have been talking about orders of protection. When these women file, uh, one of the questions and some of the evidence that the uh, government looks for is, did they file an order of protection? Again, 
I submit to you that people from different cultures and different areas don't necessarily know about this. My colleague says in uh, Philadelphia they do, and that's a very good thing, but there's another cultural test here. Some women don't know they have been abused because their culture says, if I don't please the man, he smacks me around. You know, and they, they don't know. When they get in their own groups, and sometimes they tend to stay in their own ethnic group, maybe other women will tell them, no, you can get protection if you do that. They're afraid because they are going now, not against a government entity, but against a family entity. And this goes against culture. So if you have someone who does not get the order of protection and the, uh, the petition says, but I was beaten constantly and I was harmed, they may not necessarily be able to have that petition approved. Uh, so, but VAWA does co uh, cover that incident because you can be married and if the marriage uh, falls apart before two years, uh, then you don't necessarily get the permanent residence. You have to show you're married two years. But if this domestic violence comes into play, uh, then you, uh, you can self-petition. You don't need this person who married you. Uh, to come and sponsor you. So that is a very good position, um, part of the VAWA law. However, domestic abuse, that's another story. Domestic abuse can start with women when they are in their own country and continue when they get to the United States. The issue, there are many issues surrounding domestic violence and the ability of an individual to obtain a green card because one has suffered from that abuse. One stumbling block or issue is this is, again, not government violence. And as I told you, in order to get a green card, if you say, I need political asylum, I need protection, you have to show it's because of race, religion, nationality, membership in a, in a social group, or political opinion. We have a, a case, matter of RA, that uh, several attorneys general have referred back to themselves. And in this case, this woman was, from the moment she married, battered and tortured by her husband in the most indescribable and horrific manner you can imagine. She was raped daily, she was punched, she was unconscious, <coughs> he took a cleaver to her, he sodomized her, she ran away, she went back to him. Why? Because she had a son. And he said, you'll never see this son again, and she went back to him. She finally escaped, she comes to the United States, she puts on the case, and it was denied because they could not make the nexus between social group, that's the only group, it wasn't political opinion unless it's women should this not happen to. Uh, what is the social group? Women who are battered by husbands, there's a long legal explanation for why that doesn't fit. The group has been ruled to be too amorphous. The Department of Homeland Security has filed a brief where they tried to help people narrow that, you know, battered women, too big. Uh, women could be battered by nephews, fathers, husbands, it's too big a group. I'm giving you a very shortened explanation of this. So the battered women uh, have a very hard time. They can prevail, they have prevailed, but I'm just telling you, it's not easy just to come here and say this. Now women also have a continuing form of persecution. It was last week I was uh, speaking to my colleague who has a case from a woman in Somalia, and I just have a new colleague, one man in Somalia, and this woman, woman was battered and raped and horrific things happened to her in Somalia. She came to the United States, and guess what? She was raped on the street, she was beaten up by people, and she submits an application. My colleague's going, how am I going to grant this? What can I do to help this woman? And then we read, she had uh, submitted, and she was a victim of female genital mutilation. Yeah. Aha! Now we have something that, in New York and mostly across the country, we can take a hold of that. So we say, okay, we're actually going to downplay the beating, the battering, the rapes, and we're going to have female genital mutilation case. So that requires her to go to a doctor in the United States. He will examine her. He will write a letter. He will say that is true. Should she have a female child, we will send the female child, say you must get this child tested, because we want to make sure that the female child is not a victim of female genital mutilation. And then hearing that case, there is extensive and interesting case law, because uh, the statute does not define persecution. The statute does not say female genital mutilation is a continuing source of um, uh, persecution, which 
some of us hope that it is, but I speak not for the Department of Justice. But um, <laughs> at any rate, um, there's case law on that. And so um, this female genuine is another instance where if the man is in the room, uh, the, you can see the body language because we're not so sure the man is not in favor, the man being the husband, the life partner, the father of children, because this is a cultural thing. Now, the United Nations, um, the uh, UNICEF and the World Health Organization issued a document way back in 1997, and the joint statement is something that we use and is very important, and it addresses this female uh, genital mutilation in a, um, an excellent way. Part of the statement says, even though cultural practices may appear senseless or destructive for the standpoint of others, they have meaning and fulfill a function for those who practice them. However, culture is not static. It is a, in constant flux. People will change their behavior when they understand the hazards of the harmful practices and when they realize it is possible to give up harmful practices without giving up meaningful aspects of the culture. It is not right to sit and say, well, that was stupid, and that, no, you have to take it in the context it is. What happened here? Women don't know that was not, so they didn't have to do that. They think it was the honor of the family. You have to deal with this culture. Diane, Professor Rosenfeld, when she's talking about the monkeys and the changing behavior, so when the UN uh, makes that statement, that's very, uh, an excellent uh, component for the work we do. We rely on the State Department report, but we have the unforgiving uh, forces of time here because these cultures have been going on. This is violence in some cases, women against women, because it is the culture, but it is the grandmother or the mother who takes this child and has this child circumcised. And when we ask them, why did you let that happen? Why did you let your aunt or your grandmother take your child? The woman goes, I couldn't help it. Now we sit here in New York going, well, she couldn't help it. You know, We're sitting here in this room, these, live in, these women are living in huts. These women are living in villages where there is no uh, global uh, awareness at all. This is their life. They are shocked when they find out we consider this wrong. So as uh, Sally Kadar said to us when we had our phone conference, okay, what can make this better? What can make this better? The laws are made by Congress. Now show me a group of, of uh, people who are trying to make things better in the immigration law. I'll show you a, a group of underpaid and underfunded uh, people. So, but if the lobbyists, um, you know, work to change the law, and it, um, we have many excellent um, organizations, Catholic charities, legal aid, Lutheran uh, services, who work to try to put pressure to change. It can happen. There's a law called. We don't use this in our court, but it's Adam Walsh. Uh, I-130 law. What happened is a young child was uh, kidnapped in Florida many years ago, and now on the books there's a, a protection against uh, for sexual predators. Now that uh, goes into the visa process, and it does affect people because it uh, made a longer period of time the petitions that are done in consular offices outside the United States. What happened is people went, oh, it's taking too long, it's taking too long. Massive writing, massive contacting Congress people, and they stopped it. But now it's back, I'm giving a very short version of this, and now there's a six month wait uh, for anyone who has any, any uh, one who's petitioning for anyone to come to the United States if they have any record at all of, of sexual um, predators or uh, sexual convictions. But that Adam Walsh law was a very much uh, changing under the pressure of people who uh, wrote and challenged Congress and challenged the law. So again, I end with uh, what I said in the beginning. We come here today to speak out loud, and it's very important. I'm not even sure who my audience is, actually, but everyone here speaks out loud. Salah Kadar speaks out loud. Professor Rosenfeld speaks out loud. Uh, we try. <laughs> We're judges. But anyway, so thank you for this opportunity to speak out loud. Thank you so much. It is so important, especially for the audience here are, you know, a mixture international, obviously, from all over the world. So, you know, so they all understand what it is you're talking about. And I think being an immigration uh, judge, it, it hits with everybody who is here, a lot of people who are here. Um, we were, you know, also with, with the um, migration law, I happened to, to study that, and I'm, you know, we just had that 
few weeks ago, we had a conference here about migration law. People came from all over the world. And um, a lot goes on, a lot goes on. And, you know, we all have our opinion. And I always thought that you know, we have to make countries liable and the countries who, who um, export and import, you know, the workers, they both should be liable because abuse is, you have to educate people before they leave. And when they receive them, they also should be liable. But this is um, amongst many problems that we have around the world. I just wanted to say one other thing. Please. I'm sorry. When we talk about education, the question is, whom do we educate? Exactly. Just the women, or must we educate the men the, and the brothers? Men. Because men. that's oh. part of uh, where the violence is being. Okay. No, it's true. And also the children. Um, we host here our organization. For the past three years, we have hosted the uh, Montessori students from all over the world to the model United Nations. And I host them and have them uh, filmed by our uh, friend Roger here. Um, and they go through, they learn how the system works, they learn how to vote, they learn, and these are kids that come here and they learn the whole year in their schools and with the teachers who are trained, and they come here. And I host them. 2,000 students I had last year. Yeah. So, um, and I tell them then, as children, because they will never forget that experience. Mm -hmm. I say to them, you are equal. I give them, I, my speech is about <laughs> human rights. And I say that to each one of them, because they will always remember that we are equal, meaning boys and girls, colors, religion, everything. And for some reason, they like it and they appreciate it and then they come and say a great you know, speech or whatever. They never forget it. So we have to start from them when they're very young, very young, boys and girls. Thank you again. Now I would like to introduce our fifth speaker. And uh, she is... Um, an associate professor of civil law at Istanbul University in Turkey. She had a BA and MA degree from Istanbul University, Faculty of Law. She got her PhD from Cologne University in Germany. She conducted a postdoctoral research at Bonn University International and European Law Faculty. Uh, she's a specialist in private law. She has many publications on the issue, as well as personal law and obligations, and obligations law. Her area of skills include the EU civil law, women and children right, and legal solution to bioethical question. She's also the author of a book, Trust Liability. Please welcome with me, Ms. Dr. Buru Kalkan. I'm very happy to be here. Dear guests, distinguished speakers, um, it's a privilege for me to be speaking here, and I want to thank U.S. Federation for Middle East Peace for giving me this opportunity. Women's rights in Turkey are not regarded as late and underdeveloped compared to many Western countries. Turkey is the only country which changed all relations about individual, family, and social life with the law reform and switched from religious law to secular law. In recent years, the agenda in Turkey has focused on violence against women because of the fact that violence against women has reached high levels, that media has discussed on the subject in an increasing resultant in important legal measures. Progressive steps have been taken to prevent violence against women by various public institutions <coughs> and NGOs. Also for the first time, even institutions like the army and the presidency of villages at Paris, which are male-dominated started campaigns on this issue. Also various legal measures have been taken, both aimed at domestic law and in terms of participating in the international agreement. Among these, the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence and Domestic Violence Against Women, commonly known as the Istanbul Convention, 
was signed in Istanbul in May 2011. This convention is the first international convention intending to prevent violence against women. It's also important in terms of being open for a signature led by Turkey and in terms of Turkey's leadership in a subject like that. Because as we all know, approach in Europe is that Islamic countries are not very active in terms of human rights. The importance of Islamic Convention is that it regards violence against women not as a social pact or problem, but as a violation of human rights and a fact based on the inequality between men and women. By seeing the fight against violence as a gender mainstreaming in a broader perspective, this convention made up of 81 articles is the first obligatory international convention on combating domestic violence against women. Turkey is the first country to sign and confirm this convention. In terms of domestic, violence, domestic law, the final form of the law on protection of family and prevention of violence against women entered into force in an important date on Women's Day, March 8, 2012. When this law is compared to the laws in other countries, because of the fact that it contains many rights for women who are subjected to violence and many measures aimed at protection of women victims, it's a significant and progressive regulation. And it's a more advanced example compared to similar and Western laws in terms of prevention of violence and giving government the duty of protector. It's necessary to take a closer look at the law on the protection of family and prevention of domestic violence against women because it's directly related to the subject of family and <coughs> prevention of violence and it causes some problems in practice. Violence is defined in the law in the Parliament 8 March 2012. Any kind of physical, sexual, uh, psychological, verbal or economical attributes and behaviors that occur in social, public or private life including the acts that result in or may result in physical, sexual, psychological or economic damage or pain in person and threats and enforcement and arbitrary prevention of freedom. Violence against women may be committed as physical, mental, sexual and economic violence. The law protects women, children, family members and those followed uh, persistently who are the victims subjected or in danger of being subjected to violence. The regulations put in order in the law on protection of family and prevention of violence against women are as follows. In accordance with CEDAW, the law has a more extensive scope of application than the law number 4320 in that it does not include any discrimination about marital status and it is applied to other family members as well. The purpose of the law is to protect women children, family members, and those followed uh, persistently who are the victims subjected or in danger of being subjected to violence, and to regulate the procedures and principles regarding the precautions to be taken with the aim of preventing the violence against them. Basic principles for implementing the law and rendering services are also arranged. For the protected person, the protective injunctions such as determining of shelter, temporary financial assistance, psychological, occupational, legal and social support services taken under temporary protection of their own initiative and benefit from the nursery offer. Decisions about precautionary preventive measures will be by civilian authority in cases where <coughs> delay will be detrimental. Chiefs of law enforcement officers shall make decisions on what precautionary protective injunction measures can be taken and evidence and documents shall not be required while making decisions. If protected persons working or residence place needs to change because of the threat of danger to his or her life, the protective injunctions about changing identity card and other information or documents within the framework of the Witness Protection Act shall be taken by the judge. In addition, the judge shall make decisions about parental power, custodian, alimony and entering into personal connection. The provision on alimony is in parallel with the provision in the previous act. Besides the provision, the victim is provided with temporary financial support. Moreover, the general health expenses of those about whom injections are taken are considered in the law and their expenses not covered. Protect besides this provision, the victim is provided with temporary financial support. Protective injections are taken without searching for evidence of the act of violence, 
Preventive injections are taken and implemented without any delay, and the decision for refusal or of injections request is only announced to the protected person. If required, and upon request, the injections, the identities, or information to disclose the identities and addresses of directly protected person <coughs> and other family members shall be kept confidential. Thank you so much. I My last part. Okay. It's important to constantly. We have some more notes. Okay. It's important to constantly emphasize that violence does not have an ethnic origin or religion. Road statistics show this in a clear way. We must accept this as a global contagious disease, and therefore we should not only push for the making of laws, but also the correct interpretation and practicing of them. It's also important to push for solutions that embrace all segments of society without making any discrimination based on ethnic, racial, economic, sexual, or religious status. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, we have one after another, so they're already outside setting, and I'm, I'm so sorry we didn't have enough time for questions and answers. Forgive us, but I hope you all enjoy the knowledge from all the distinguished guests. I thank all of you. Thank you, each and every one of you. Please give them a big applause. Thank you. Thank you.